The Lord Nelson class. HMS Lord Nelson herself. An interesting ship. A capable vessel. A vessel which, by every right, should have been the leading vessel of its navy. The status... Let's be honest, given the name, Lord Nelson, named for... Well... Personally, not my first choice as Britain's greatest admiral. He's definitely in the top ones. And I would agree with Prof, uh, Prof Lambert that he is Britannia's god of war. But... What can I say? I've always been more of a Collingwood fan, and frankly, Duncan as well. And for me, greatest, they're all up there as a very hot tight free, including Anson and Howe. Mm, Rodney, probably just about level below. Just, just pipped out. But still, Lord Nelson. HMS Lord Nelson. That is the name for a fleet flagship. That is the name for a ship which is to, designed to make the enemies of Britain quake. And yet... No. No, it doesn't. <sighs> Shameless book plug. It's a funny old... Honestly, if I'd thought that my first book was going to be about destroyers, I might have actually started work on this earlier. Rather than, after my PhD was over, deciding that I wanted to take a long gap from naval aviation. I had spent four years on it by that point in terms of PhD, in terms of getting the PhD rent, three years, getting it through the examinations process, a year, including scheduling people, and... Some minor revisions, which were fair. But no. It was a fun time, but afterwards wanted to do something else. And this is what came from it. Travels, Battles and Darings. Also, there's a project on Town Class Cruisers, a project on the Flower Class, which has been turned into a book, and a project on the U-Class Submarines. All being turned into books. But yes, Britain's last sovereign star battleship. And there are some of you who are going to go, hang on, Lord Nelson class, it's named for Lord Nelson. There's also Agamemnon. It must have been, you know, Agamemnon must have been Britain's last sovereign star battleship. No, it's not. You see, Nelson is laid down on the 18th of May 1905. Agamemnon is laid down on the 15th of May 1905. Nelson is launched on the 4th of September 1906. Agamemnon, the 23rd of June, 1906. Nelson is commissioned in December, 1908. 1st of December, 1908. Agamemnon was commissioned 25th of June, 1908. If you're thinking this should have been the Agamemnon class, well, yes, but Lord Nelson is the other option. What are these ships for? What are these ships about? They are the Royal Navy building, in many ways, the safety. They are the continuation of all the designs that have been going on. They are the designs which make sense. There's also a small issue with them. Just a small issue. That this vessel is commissioned in, well, 1908. Which I mean completed and, uh, completed and all those things in 1908. And by the time she is completed, not only has Dreadnought been in service for two years, but in many ways these were the insurance for Dreadnought. Well, the Bellafron class are well and truly under construction. In fact, all three, Bellafron, Temeraire and Superb, have actually been launched. They are all launched in 1907. And Bellafron is actually commissioned in February 1909. So, 
last Sovereign Star battleship. This is the continuation of all those runner battleships. This is what they've grown into. And these are good ships. Please do not doubt me when I say they are good ships. And for their style of battleship, they are really good. They've been preceded by the Swiftster class, which, well, they'd been armed with 10 inch and 7.5 and inch guns, but mainly because they've been for Chile rather than for the Royal Navy. But when Chile didn't want them, the Royal Navy procured them. And the King Edward class, which are what officially precede these, again, carry the 12 inch guns. Not the same 12 inch guns. They carry the 40 caliber Mark 9 rather than the 45 caliber Mark 10. But they do have 9.2 inch guns. But they have four of those. Lord Nelsons have 10. So what are we seeing here? Well, it's basically a thing. If Dreadnought doesn't work, if you can't actually get the long-range salvoing to work, so engagement range are still going to be much shorter, much closer, than 12-inch guns are really necessary for, and at the point at which more rapid-fire weapons are, involved, are useful, i.e., the rate of fire of a 9.2 inch gives you a real meaningful advantage over even a 12 inch in terms of volume of fire and number of shells you're actually impacting your enemy with. Well, then this ship would have been far better. If the fire control and ranging systems which were going to allow Dreadnought to take advantage of its 12-inch guns had not worked. If they had failed. Then these, this class, the Lord Nelsons, would have still been powerful enough to guarantee Britain's lead in the world. A broadside of five 9.2 inch guns and four 12 inch guns would be more than enough for them to take on any other Sovereign Star battleship in the world. The British had replaced the 6 inch gun because testing had suggested that the 6 inch guns in lightly armoured casemates were likely to be taken out at longer range by the 12 inch guns before they managed to get to decisive engagement points i.e. the enemy ship might not take out you, but they could take out your main method of killing it. And there's a level at which you're going to defend a 6 inch to that you're not really going to exceed because the level of defense exceeds its value, especially its value of its hitting power and its range of hitting power, which is why the British had ended up going up to a secondary which was far larger. This is where the 9.2 inch gun came in. This is where the capabilities of this class came in. You also notice the high positions for the set uh, the well, I'd call them tertiary weapons. The tertiary weapons, of course, being the 12 pounders and the 3 pounders. Those weapons are high up with a commanding view able to spot their opponents and engage light, fast targets, i.e. torpedo boats, at range, and hopefully stop them getting close enough to unleash their, uh, unleash their deadly cargo. Although those who've been watching the Motor Torpedo Boat series on my channel will no doubt know that the uh, some of the torpedo boats had some really interesting methods of laying their... Um, <clears throat> their eggs. As a quick study of the stats reveal, this this class changed over time. They started off as of roughly 15,604 tons in normal. This grows. Yeah. By a certain point it's roughly 16,000 tons. There's a debate as to how much. and It goes to roughly 18,100 tons in deep. The point is that 
if let's say you'd been designing a treaty limit system where the sovereigns or as post model one they'd probably call them pre-dreadnought ships have been included you'd have probably end up with roughly a 15,000 ton limit and could have ended up with some interesting well British American perhaps even Japanese takes on what the Germans did with the uh, Deutschland class I we are allowed to replace our coastal defense slash pre uh, slash pre dreadnought ships with an equivalently far pa powerful vessel what will be appear? But they didn't. Despite the fact that there were several pre dreadnoughts serving, or sovereign style ships as I prefer, serving with other navies around the world in this period and are covered by the treaty. Length uh, 135.2 meters. Now, that always interests me because if you consider the length of the Dreadnought herself is 160.6 meters. So the difference in length between the Dreadnought and Lord Nelson's, 25.4 meters. In terms of beam, these are 24.2 meters. The beam of the Dreadnought is 25 meters. You can argue very quickly that this is a ship designed around the idea of a more closer range combat, of a higher level of maneuverability if you consider that beam to length ratio. That is a more maneuver focused beam. And let me look at the rest of them. Well, the draft of the Lord Nelsons, 7.9 meters. The draft of Drenaut, 9 meters in deep load. This is where things start to really get interesting, because you start to realize the efficiency of the power of turbines versus triple expansion engines in this period. Because the Royal Navy is not buying bad triple expansion engines. They are not buying bad turbines. They're just not going to rig things that way. And I did read a very interesting conspiracy theory where basically Fisher hamstrung this class in order to make Dreadnought look better than it was. Honestly, he didn't need to. And there's a reason. They had 15. The Lord Nelson's 15 Babcock and, Wilco uh, Babcock and Wilcox water tube boilers. Dreadnought, 18 of them. Now, the two triple expansion and steam engines managed to draw from those 15 Babcock and Wilcox water tube boilers 16,750 indicated horsepower to drive two shafts for a top speed of 18 knots, or a range of 9,118 9, nautical miles at 10 knots. HMS Dreadnought, well... She could, thanks to two steam turbine sets, each set driving two shafts, and being supplied by 18 Babcock and Wilcox boilers, she was deploying 23,000 shaft horsepower, which is roughly 17,000 kilowatts, as opposed to the 12,490 kilowatts that you get of the triple expansion engines. And that gave her a top speed of 21 knots. It's a free knot advantage. Allows her to dictate range. And she also has a range herself of 6,620 nautical miles at 10 knots. So, she's able to go 3 knots faster, which allows her to dictate range, but her own range of operation, her radius of operation, is well over 2,000 nautical miles shorter. In fact, it's roughly two and a half thousand. I think it's 2,560 from memory, but I could be wrong. Complement. Peacetime, roughly 750. Wartime, roughly 817, 800, 817. And again, with the Dreadnought, peacetime complement, roughly 700. Wartime complement, uh, 810. So, roughly equivalent. Differences, though, four 12-inch Mark 10 guns in four and a half, in two four and a half turrets. Uh, 
Whereas Dreadnought had 10 of those in 5 twin turrets. Dreadnought had no 9.2 inch guns. Well, Nelson did. Dreadnought did have 27 12 pounder guns compared to the 24 of Lord Nelson's, and did have some, well, some f uh, three pounder guns as well added later on, although they're not always listed as their initial armament. I think they, they come in during World War Two, <coughs> World War One. Sorry, torpedo program yesterday. World War II, it was all about World War Two. <sighs> we need to come up with better names. Just calling it World War, uh, just calling it World War is just turning into a franchise. And both Dreadnought and Law Nelsons had five 18 inch torpedo tubes. It's a well, well designed ship. Especially when you start going, well, hang on. Amidships, it actually has a thicker belt because it goes 12 inches rather than 11 inches. Um, deck armor 0.75 to 3 inches well the deck armor on this vessel on Lord Nelson's that goes up to 4 inches thick and never goes less than 1.5 inches thick I suppose you can argue 1 inch on the middle but again that's thicker the turret armor, pretty much the same. They are the same turrets. The conning tower, thicker. Bulkheads, the same. Barbettes, 12 inches, thicker. So, the, uh, the Lord Nelsons, slower. But a lot more armor. A lot more armor. But let's consider this because this is the real thing that makes an either or proposition in the Royal Navy when they are planning it. There is a bit of a, a bit of truth wandering around in the scenario. In that, when you talk about this class, and you talk about Lord Nelson class, and you think back to their predecessor classes, you think back to those ships and how many date the Royal Navy tends to order, the Royal Navy ordered eight King Edward VII's. They ordered six Duncan's. Ordering two Lord Nelsons. That's unusual. Now this actually helps with the procurement of Dreadnoughts and keeping it quiet and under wraps. Because the thing is, when you're procuring the same guns as you are procuring for your, pre uh, for your Sovereigns starships, your Lord Nelsons, People are less likely to notice what you're doing. It's also a way of de-risking the guns. Because the 12-inch 45s, which are usually listed as 305mm, but were actually 304.8s. But yes, I do usually call them 305s because it just it's easier and rolls off the tongue. A little bit easier than 304.8, but if we're being accurate, 304.8. This de-risks it, because you're ordering guns which are off the shelf. This is not just off the shelf, but practically in use. It de-risks Dreadnought. It de-risks the Lord Nelsons. It also de-risks your ordering profile, because in it, instead of ordering something different, instead of ordering something else, you order, we're ordering these guns. Yeah, people will look, oh, well, it's just another Lord Nelson. All the British are building is another Lord Nelson. That's what a lot of people thought. 
Maybe an improved Lord Nelson. I had no idea this was coming out. It has five of those turrets on it. Five 12-inch turrets. That's enough turrets that would probably equip three Lord Nelsons. Think of that. The same turrets could have equipped three Lord Nelsons. Is Dreadnought really worth three Lord Nelsons? Doesn't have the 9.2 inch guns, so maybe not quite equivalent to three. Let's say it's equivalent to two. Is it equivalent to two Lord Nelsons? That's the question which the Royal Navy is asking. The Royal Navy, when they build Dreadnought, are not going immediately, yes, yes. This has decided everything. No, they look at it. They test it. Yes, they're ordering new ships, but they can change them. They have enough industrial capacity, and they have a humongous number of these ships already in service in terms of Lord Nelsons. Because they do have the King Edward the Seventh. They do have the Duncans. They do have all the others that came before them. And that helps them. That is useful for them. So even whilst Palmers in Yarrow are building the Lord Nelson, she's being evaluated compared to Dreadnought, and they're working out what next. In many ways, it makes sense from that angle that Fisher jumps into the Invincibles, jumps into the battle cruisers because... Well, hang on, the idea might not work for a battleship, but it might work for a battlecruiser. Let's go test it. Now, there's also something seriously wrong in that you should be ordering at least two or three Dreadnoughts at the same time. You should probably be matching those with your order of Lord Nelsons to properly watch them, especially as you're a major power and you're doing things supposedly in a very conservative manner. And it is the most conservative leap forward known to mankind in terms of defence. In fact, all defence leap forwards tend to be incredibly conservative. I.e., yes, we are taking a leap forward, but we've de-risked everything. It's, if we look at the current thing, um, I was in a briefing the other day about the Type 26. And everyone was acting as if it was a brand new idea, the fact that the... Royal Navy has been de-risking a lot of the systems which are going to go in the Type 26 by fitting them to the Type 23s when they go in for refit. So a lot of the systems which are going to make up the systems on the Type 26, we're already working out whether they work together, we're already working out their kinks because they're already being fitted onto the Type 23s. And there's people going, oh, it's, it, this, is, this, is, this is innovative, this is groundbreaking, you know. And I'm sitting there going... Um, no, we've been doing this for a long time. What is the Dreadnought armed with? She's armed with 12-inch guns. The only way you could have made her more historically British is if she'd been armed with 13.5-inch guns. But they were developing the 12-inch guns at the time, and that was the one they had at the 45 level, the 45 cal, which is the, the best level they wanted. You know, it gave them the range that they wanted. So that's what they fitted her with. But those guns were being built and were being designed, tested, and their turrets shaped on the ones which were being put for, for Lord Nelson's. So that change is actually part of the Lord Nelson development. It's not part of the Dreadnought development. And British battleships. And British battleships very rarely make more than three changes over their six, uh, predecessors. Three major changes. It's usually what you have linking each different class. The interesting thing about their cost-wise is that Lord Nelson's cost um, 1.65 million. Dreadnought cost 1.7, well, honestly, 7.85, so you could say 1.79 million, in a way, if you're rounding it up to two decimal points. So for a differential of 
let's be honest, it's one, two, four? Let's see, well, yeah, roughly, roughly, one, two, 124,000, eh, 124,300 pounds, roughly. You end up with faster, slightly less armor in certain places, but a lot bigger. And able to take uh, to mount a lot more twelve-inch guns. That's the differential between Lord Nelson and the Reynolds. The other differential, though, comes in terms of the pace of construction. Because Dreadnought once she enters service, as I already mentioned, the Bellafrons are launched and on their way. By the time that Lord Nelson enters the water, and is commissioned and is in service with the Royal Navy. In fact, they're soon to be commissioned. But the Invincible class... They are actually laid down and completed and commissioned in the time it takes to build the Law Nelsons. So, you have these three trains of development happening simultaneously. You have the Dreadnought Armoured Cruisers, aka Battle Cruisers, you of the Invincibles. Where it's... and This is, the again, in true Royal Navy tradition... It's Indomitable, which is commissioned on 25th of June, 1908, the same day as Agamemnon, Lord Nelson's sister. Then Inflexible is commissioned in the 20th of October, 1908. So she's commissioned before Lord Nelson is. And then it's Invincible, which comes in after Lord Nelson on March, 1909. It's just... It's the way things go. And actually, Invincible comes in after Bellafron. So, that is the Royal Navy. That is the Royal Navy's style of construction. Sometimes ships overlap. Sometimes the pace of yards help. And sometimes Her Majesty's Dockyard Portsmouth really does knock it out of the park when they are building what is basically an improved, uh, improved dreadnought. And all of them are armed with a 12-inch 45. All of them are armed with a Mark 10 naval gun. So the insurance, let's be honest, that's a way, in a way, what Lord Nelson's become. And the two pu and the two pushes, because if Dreadnought had proved a success, but the joyous thing that is the Invincibles had not in terms of their assessment by the Royal Navy, then the Lord Nelsons would have been even more essential, probably at, especially considering their range of, you know, the range the the triple expansion engines gave them, etc., versus speed, but the range, their armour, their firepower, they would have been flagships of distant stations. They would have been what you would find on the China station and distant other stations, which didn't require a first-class battle fleet. You could honestly see a line developing where the Lord Nelsons become a second-class battleships, which are designed for distant stations, and the Dreadnoughts become the core battle fleet, and the Invincibles fade away. That is a, quite a possible turn of history. But the Invincibles are judged as a success. Dreadnought is judged as a success. The Bellafrons are judged as a success, and the Lord Nelsons are the last. So, at that point. They're in service, though. They are literally in service, and they are already surplus to requirements? No. There aren't enough Dreadnoughts in service quickly enough to make them surplus to requirements immediately. In fact, they're pretty darn useful. And they're assigned to the home fleet straight away. And they serve with the home fleet until 1914. So, despite all the Dreadnought race going on, despite all those battleships coming in, Lord Nelson stay with the home fleet. In 1909, Lord Nelson is the, created as the flagship of the Vice Admiral commanding the Nord Division of the home fleet. But... She's a private ship again by 1914 because vice admirals go, we want something prettier, or rather newer. 
but she's used to being a flagship, and as such, she's perfect for her next task. She's assigned to the Channel Fleet, becoming the fleet flagship. And she leads the coverage of the Expeditionary Force as it's moved across the English Channel. While the Dreadnoughts are being gathered together in the Ground Fleet to commence the blockade and the distance work to counter the High Seas Fleet, the Sovereign Style ships, with the Lord Nelsons at their head, are being gathered to protect the Expeditionary Force as it forges its way across the Channel. If necessary, to buy time with, them, uh, with their own lives, pretty much, should the High Seas Fleet try to interfere for, so the Ground Fleet will be able to get there and intervene. But again, what happens? Well, ne next, what happens next is we have another crisis area. We've got the uh, we've got the army across the channel. We've got a minefield there. We've got all sorts of stopping forces there. The ground fleet's in place. The intelligence stuff is working. Okay, where's our next major issue? Oh, we're doing stuff in the Mediterranean. We're going to need to have the Darnells campaign. Lord Nelson's ascent to help blockade the Goban. And Lord Nelson becomes flagship again, this time of the Dardanelles Squadron. Which later, of course, becomes the Eastern Mediterranean Squadron. Then the Aegean Squadron. Yeah, very quickly, she, she managed to, in her history, suddenly go through racking up all these different names as flagship of these different stations without ever moving. She's Go to one of the ships which has the most different stations she is flagship of in terms of name, station, name of station. And never moves. <laughs> From this point on, they spend most of their war smashing away at Turkish forts, positions, doing covering the evacuation of Gallipoli, and then carrying on guarding against Goban and Breslau. Their job is to protect against those vessels coming out, to deter them, and if necessary, combat them. And again, they don't have the speed to really chase down the Goban. They, not unless it's significantly under maintained, which at certain points it possibly could have been. But they do have the firepower. They do have the armor that they can stand up to fight it. And honestly, if both of them were there, I'm not sure the Goban would win. Now, that's not necessarily a good thing, though, because it means that when they're away, that's when Goban and Breslau, renamed, of course, uh, Yavuz Sultan Mesalim and Midil, come out. They come out when... Lord Nelson is in Salonika, Greece, and Agamemnon is in Mudros, on the island Lemos. And they would change around, but they were there in covering positions on call positions. It was during that period that Agamemnon actually managed to shoot down a German Zeppelin, which was trying to do a bombing mission. Yes. HMS Dreadnought sinks a submarine by reversing over it, and Agamemnon shoots down a Zeppelin. British cavalry ships have an interesting World War I. They really do. Unfortunately, as mentioned, when Yavuz Sultan Salim and Midili um, attempted a sortie in Mediterranean in the beginning of 1918, uh, they managed to take part in the Battle of Imbros. I've covered this in other videos, but basically they sink some monitors, which are in a position providing fire support to the army, and they can't get away. They are not fast enough to run away, so they try and defend themselves in this little bay. They get caught, they get sunk. However, Yazoo, Sultan Salim, and Midili are so busy trying to get away from these two ships coming after them that they actually enter a minefield and Midili, Breslau is sunk after hitting many mines and 
Selene, well, is also damaged and ends up having to withdraw back to the Dardanelles. After the Ottoman Empire signs the Almastas of Mudros on board Agamemnon, not Lord Nelson, Agamemnon, Agamemnon took part. Take part <clears throat> Agamemnon took part in the occupation of Constantinople. Lord Nelson went into the Black Sea. Eventually, in I think it was by the end of June 1919, because sort of that sort of period, they are returned both at home and reduced to reserve. Lord Nelson sold for scrap in June 1920. Anna Magnum is converted to a radio-controlled target ship. So she can be bashed up by, uh, by dreadnought battleships to improve their gunnery. She sold for scrap in 1927. It's sad, really. But... Agamemnon really does give us some of the better pictures. And whilst I go more detail about Lord Nelson, I think it's you know, quite fun to put up Ag some of the cool photos from Agamemnon here. Uh, a three pounder hot chest gun, high angle mount, what she used to shoot down a Zeppelin. I mean, I'm not sure whether to be embarrassed for the Zeppelin or not. Honestly, this thing, it's Rare you feel... It's going to sound strange. You don't... As a military naval historian, you... Um, you don't enjoy reading about people dying. That's really not what you do, you're do. you doing the history for. If you have someone who actually enjoys reading about people dying, they probably back away from them quite quickly. But you do develop a sort of... How do I put this? A bit of... It doesn't affect you as much because you read about it so often. Not in a bad you're in you're inured to death and you don't care anyway kind of way, but in more case of Well, sadly enough, it's war. These things happen. It's a matter of fact scenario. You can still feel other emotions though, and honestly, when I look at that three pounder gun and I realise that shot down a Zeppelin I, I feel a bit embarrassed, I think, for these episodes. I think that's the correct emotion I'm feeling. And, of course, this is the 9.2-inch guns being used to fire at Ottoman forts in the 4th of March, 1915. Now, interestingly enough, Lord Nelson, if we're going to talk about her career, and she's the subject of today's video, when they first arrived in Dardanelles, Queen Elizabeth, HMS Queen Elizabeth, is the flagship. Hey, we've got a Queen Elizabeth class uh, battleship as flagship with 15-inch guns. At some point, someone realizes, why do we have a Queen Elizabeth class? Why do we need a Queen Elizabeth class? To frighten Goban. Goban doesn't want to come out and fight these things. We need her back in the UK. Send her home. And Lord Nelson takes over as flagship. One of the fun things is, right at that point, sorry, new camera. <sighs> That's not helping, is it? <laughs> Stay. Bye. And we're back. It's better camera. It's working now with the systems and everything's happy with it. Now OBS is happy, but it is a new camera. And I forget that if I wave my hand or I make an L sign with my fingers, it does things because it's smarter than I am. It's terrible when your camera's funny. I don't think I'd covered the fact that at one point in this period before she becomes flagship, she's actually hit by the Turkish thoughts on a couple of occasions, including a stone cannonball landing on her deck. That 
her flag officer, who was aboard, actually decided to keep. Because, <laughs> you know, that's what you do. Uh, she was... Well, she had damage to her rigging, her superstructure. She was holed by one hit below the waterline, and that flooded two coal bunkers. But she returned, went to Malta, she got repaired, and returned pretty quickly. Within... Within 10 days, she's back. This is the good thing about this design. It's very, very repairable. And the coal bunkers are really useful. Let's be honest, coal bunkers are a very useful system on ships. In that, as well as fuel, they're also a defense mechanism. However, remember, coal dust is not so good. So empty bunkers, not as helpful as full bunkers. Really not as helpful. At times, they were flying kite balloons, and other vessels would sometimes fly them for them. Most of the time, of course, she's a flagship, and her flagship duties sometimes are pretty darn varied, with her having the army and navy aboard. And she had Kitchener, she had... Rosslyn Erskine Weymouth, of course, when he was Vice Admiral there, and then she had John the Roebuck when he was a succeeded Weymouth. She would go on in this role constantly. And this shows the utility of the design. It shows what she could be used for. The fact that after this was all over, she would, in the period after the, the, the Armistice, etc., would serve as flagship in the Black Sea, and would, in April 1919, evacuate Grand Duke Nicholas and Grand Duke Peter of Russia from the Black Sea to Genoa. Would prove her value again. She was an incredibly useful ship in a very much a changing world. When she starts out as service, everyone's worried whether they are punting for the right thing with long-range guns. By the time she finishes, aircraft and submarines are as much a part of the naval landscape as battleships. In possibly one of the strangest turn of events, in 1922 when she is scra actually scrapped properly, She's sold to a shipbreaking company in Dover in 1920. She's then resold again on the 8th of November 1920. And then after that, she sold again to a third scrapping company. Which results in her being towed to Germany in January 1922 and scrapped in Germany. HMS Lord Nelson is scrapped in Germany. There you go. That's the way she ends. It's a difficult job to design a safety. And often the best course of action you can take is not to actually design a safety. And when I'm talking about this, I'm talking about a safety system. A safety system as in another ship which can fulfill the role. We live in a very interesting era. Where people will always be telling you that... Surface ships, their days are numbered, we're all going underwater, or the aircraft carries over and hypersonic missiles are in, and all these new systems are coming in. And they might well be. They might not be. History is littered with as many, if not more, many more, you can argue, full starts and promises than it is actual definitive evolutions. And most systems, in fact, the vast majority of systems, when they come into service, are additions to things, rather than destroyers. The Dreadnoughts do not destroy the Sovereigns and the previous generation battleships. They merely supplant them, but they're still battleships. The Lord Nelsons aren't designed as safeties. They are designed as the next evolution of firepower. They're designed as the next level of capability. 
which they are. But they are the even more conservative step than Dreadnought. Yet at the same point, the technologies being used for them de-risk technologies for Dreadnought. The technologies being used for them de-risk technologies being used for the Invincible class. For the next jumps, the leaps the Royal Navy is about to make, the very conservative great leaps forward, they are the safety. And again, I've done the hand thing, haven't I? I have. It's on me. Zoom out. Now you'll see how much of a mess my room is. And I'm going to bring the image back. Drop the wrong image. Sideshow back. I'm going to put it up there. So. They are this. They are the safety. Though. Because whilst they aren't designed as such, by continuing to build them, to overlap with all those ships, the Dreadnoughts, the Bellafrons, the Invincibles, the Royal Navy provides itself with a fallback position. They've not lost any ground. It's a luxury which only the largest power can really afford, and a nation which is prepared to truly invest in those sort of things can truly afford. A nation which is investing in infrastructure, as well as naval capabilities. Key ships is all about lessons from individual ships, and how each ship can really teach us something. Lord Nelson started out as a bit of a forgotten greatness, grandeur ignored, capability overlooked, service and constants put to one side. But that's not really what they are. What they are is the Royal Navy still ensuring that ma no matter what, it can still do its job. And that's the lesson today for us. Because if you build something as a safety, if you build something going, well, we're only building this because, well, just in case the sum, uh, just in case X or Z, Z doesn't, Y or Z doesn't work, we then still have this you tend to automatically start thinking, well, it's never going to need to really do anything or never, because that'll work. So this is just the safety. So we can skip this, skip that. But a good safety is a vessel which is designed in its own standing. And the Lord Nelson class, they actually serve really well. They're very valuable vessels. They are incredibly critical to many points of the British war effort outside of the North Sea. And they were that because at no point did anyone design them as the safety. And that is why I worry about our current generation of ship design because the periods of great technological transition are more spread out these days because in many ways the pace of technology is faster and much faster than the pace of construction so we don't see them they're refits not new builds but this makes it even more difficult when you're building a new ship what are you selecting what really is the high risk option versus the low risk option. What really represents something which you can viably upgrade to be useful for the next 30 years, which may be critical. We're talking about hypersonics, we're talking about all sorts of weapon systems these days. Lasers, all sorts of systems. Ships are more than likely going to become more and more less about what's on the individual platform and more about the platforms they arraign around themselves. Ships have always been systems of systems. But now, 
they're going to have some of those systems off board. Surface ships could well have their own undersea vessels, un uncrewed undersea vessels orbiting around them, their own uncrewed surface vessels going around them, their own uncrewed aerial ve uh, vessel, uh, aerial vehicles going around them. There are all sorts of things they could have, widening their ability to see around them, the information they can gather, and potentially enhancing their ability to strike at targets. All these things are likely to come about. And the ships we're building in this generation, next generation, are going to have to be able to do that. And because the generations are probably going to be two to three decades apart, you don't really have the option of going with a really solid existing generation design to provide coverage while you're making that transition. And that makes the choices we make today even more important. But I would say, a legacy from this period, a legacy from all of these things, is that nations which go for bigger hulls, more powerful engines, and more range, are rarely disappointed in how they are able to adapt their ships as time goes on. So I always finish these videos with a question, and I'm not going to discontinue that today. Lord Nelsons are in many ways a safety. They are a, theoretically, according to Model 1 designations, a pre-dreadnought, which are completed after dreadnoughts. So that really doesn't make sense. The whole designation of pre-dreadnought doesn't really make sense unless you're a newspaper. But we'll leave that all you're looking for a quick ca a quick phraseology in World War One when you're trying to organize lines of the two. But the question today is a bit of a what if question, but it's a worthwhile thinking one. What happens if despite the best efforts the long range fire control doesn't prove to work yet? If that they get the Lord Nelson's into service. They get Drenault into service. Maybe they even get the Invincibles into service. And they find that the long range fire control coordinating those 12 inch guns and director firing them, coordinating them, is just not working out. They aren't able to do it for some reason. How do you see the world developing if the Dreadnoughts can't come to be? in the period in 1906 onwards, but instead of delayed for 10, 15 years. Now I have a theory. Honestly, my theory is you get a sort of hybridization, and I'll put that on here. It's a hybridization whereby you end up with something which has roughly four 12 inch gun, uh, four 12, twin 12 inch turrets, super firing each ends, two pairs, and between six and eight twin 9.2 inch or something similar to that in the middle in terms of if you're the Royal Navy etc. They still grow in size and stature but they end up more uh, expanded Lord Nelson than they do a Dreadnought. But I'd love to hear what you think happens. I'd love to hear what you think the world turns out like. What have we got coming next week? Let's see. We have got coming. Ooh, building the lessons of World War II into the new Cold War reality. That should be fun. That should be good. Got some good ones coming out. Building the Fleets of Trafalgar coming. And viewer suggestion four is the 31st of October, and I'm looking forward to hear what, what people think of that and what their suggestions are going to be for it. 
Thank you very much for watching, and well, I hope you like the new cam, a new working camera. I've had it for a while. I've had it for a long while actually, but getting it to work has taken some effort, and mainly getting rid of and stop using XSplit. <laughs> Thank you very much for watching, and take care. Bye bye. Hmm.